Uh, we're very grateful to be here. Um, it's been 20 years since we moved to California. We used to be as a young couple in New York. And when we came here, we felt that this was, a, this was really paradise. We felt that there was such a potential to do so much work and there was so much inspiration on every single street that we're walking around. Um, there was so much variety of, of site conditions that it makes us feel like a, there was a great canvas here to do great paintings in a different ways. So it was very, very attractive. And um, we move and we start. And through this, all these years, we felt that we have come up with different ideas and concepts trying to respond to what is the powerful of California, the power of San Diego, which is the beauty of their sites. Every single site is a special. Every single site has a special condition. And in the process, we have also learned that not just the sites have a nice conditions, it's the people who has, who's living on those sites have a special dreams about how to entertain their spaces and how to enjoy their place of living. So it's been very, um, it's been fantastic experience to apply uh, and resolve problems in terms of living experience. And we, the best way that we thought we should do this presentation is to show you a typology of houses that are being very simple, renovated, or new houses. And little by little has been a good experience to take us to a different type of patterns of design. Patterns that are being involved already here, patterns that are being right now in these areas have always been. The only thing is that we have done is interpret it differently and then take it to maybe public work in the years to come. So um, we like to present this one because this is what attracts us the most is the different site conditions, the mountains, the oceans, the hills, the cliffs. We find that each site has a special way to be resolved. And I'm going to tell you to show you the Anton House which is uh, an artist's studio bridge. This is a typical site and a typical condition where somebody has been living for many years on his great ranch and does not want to move, wants to be there, wants to just keep the landscape as pure, as simple as possible. Love everything that it can be planted in that area for many years. She's an artist, the two of them are artists. So we need to add to their studio because after being working in a university, they went back to live there. So the idea was to don't touch the land and come out with a room that is an extension of their house. And basically we said, let's build you a bridge, a bridge that goes from one canyon to another canyon. You want to point it out? Yeah. So that's basically trying to it's frame the beginning of the canyon, which is a, a, this a journey between the top of the hill down to the bottom of the canyon. And the house is on the top of the hill. So we right said, right Let's, yeah, that's the point. Let's do that. Let's simply add to your studio a bridge building and make it a floating. With that, don't touch the landscape as much. You make one column in one side and one column to the other side. And make that the concept and make that the detail too. So how do we design a box that is floating in the middle of a canyon that it carries on their art? <laughs> so. And also the transition from one place to another one, we design a deck on the other side, arriving to sort of a rough formation when she gets to the top of this hill. In a simple way, she has the best views of the entire top of the hill. Next one. And mostly, as a bridge, we want it to feel floating, so we put 10 feet of doors in each side that opens on the two directions. So in the warm days, or in the nicest day, she can slide the entire doors in the two directions, east and west, and she literally will be floating in the studio and floating on the studio, getting the breezes from the ocean up and underneath here. And the house has all these little rooms and spaces that has to do to preserve the trees and get close to the trees and almost touch them, but mostly frame them. And that's the beauty of working with, with people like them, that they appreciate what they, want, what they have already. And, us, and for us, it's just being a tool of how do we represent that. Um, another, pop, this, is, this is, for example, the best example of what the house was all about, is she working on this bridge floating, the underneath going down for walks all the way down to the canyon, and at sunset, it sort of kind of just blow by itself. And exercising over here. And exercising. It's very Californian. It's just sort of probably, <laughs> it is. It is this sort of thing. It's living on the bridge, kind of being the sunset, open the doors, catch the breeze. 
Oh, there's a story also behind, which is there is an animal that used to come there all the way up to the canyon. And what was it? It was some sort of a, one of those something that was coming, and she loved. She was, she just loved to watch it. So, very San Diego in a way. This is a, a house that we designed for her sister, and she was living in a small, tiny cottage right on the bluff in Encinitas, on a cliff. As, as slowly eroding, and there was actually a moratorium on the construction there, so she didn't want to leave the site, leave the house, it was so beautiful, and she wanted us to renovate it, but within the constraints of this cottage. Um, and so what we decided to do, and there was a very, there is a very beautiful garden to the rear of the house. So we decided to make the house feel more like a pavilion, and we um, demolished most of the interior walls, and added a lot of accordion doors and windows on all sides and created one big loft living space. She actually came from New York living in a loft and wanted to live now in a loft on the cliff. But it's a cottage on the cliff. Tiny cottage. <laughs> I think it was 600 square feet. And so um, we left the roof line, we left the volume of the house, um, we continued materials inside and outside like the concrete floors um, and just created a very simple structure that allowed her to look down to the ocean and then back to the garden in the rear. It's so a rustic loft. Yes, <laughs> she had a lot of artwork that we squeezed into the space. This and this is, this is um, this Tillman, this is a truss house. This is a house, like typical San Diego, that is on a canyon and has ocean views, has the two together. And it was a house that we could, again, could not tear down. It was legally non-conforming, sit sitting in the public right of way. Mm -hmm. And so if they tore it down, they would have had to place their house right in their garden, which was so beautiful. So we, let, we, we kept the house. And just to explain, there was an existing structure that we kept. And then we added an addition with a node in the middle. And we made that node or elbow a way of bringing the main living spaces on the top floor of the house to bring you down into the garden, which was on the second level, so that you didn't feel like you didn't have a connection to the garden. And so here you can see this was the existing structure, and then we added the addition to the left. And then to unify the two sides, um, we created a, a, a roof ceiling treatment of trusses, so we exposed the structure that created something that unified the whole space, but also created kind of a warmth and a reflection. And we added lights to the underside, to the top side of all the trusses, so at night the whole thing really kind of glows. Um, again, we use a lot of pocket doors and sliding doors or accordion doors. Here, instead of a balcony off of the living room, which we felt would create a large dark space for the bedrooms below, we basically made the living room into a balcony and the pocket doors just open up and so that you have the guardrail right in the living room. The clients loved the existing house. They really loved it. And they were basically were working together to come up with the best solution for what, it, what, it, what their site was and what it could result. Um, this is another wonderful exercise that we had or a story that we have. This is in the neighborhood that we live. And every single time that this is in Mission Hills, and again, it's one of those beautiful little conditions in, Michel in, in San Diego. There is the beginning of a canyon, the top of a canyon with the houses surrounding. But it also has this kind of urban entry to a little pocket of streets that you just find in, in Mission Hills and other places all the time. There happens to be that there is this tiny little house that, as the time that every single time that you walk in or drive in, becomes almost like a, the gate house, you know, the controlling point house. It's this one. And at the same time, this house is surrounded by beautiful vegetation and beautiful <coughs> palms. So we call it the palm house because when you walk <coughs> in to see that side, the first thing that distracts you are the palms. The palms are all over. They're basically, there's more palms than the house. So we come up with the concept that we couldn't add anything to the house. Basically, the house could not be add any square inches. It's just sort of renovated by itself. So we lift the house up and we put a room underneath, like a basement, and we make a three-story townhouse, basically. We paint it in red, so it could come up in this staggering, and the red became sort of the background of the palms. Then at night, now, you can see more of the palms. This is the third floor. Uh, here yeah, is, a basically, the third floor. So now they come from the top, they sort of engage to come down and go into the canyon, and also they have a stair going out 
from the street all the way down. Um, and more than anything, we put packet doors all over. These packet doors are windows that slide into the back of the fireplace on the two sides. And the palms leave come into the room. All <laughs> around there. So they live with their palms, and that's what is the house, and that's the story of the house. It's a little red house with the palms. And um, they're very happy. Oh, it's too hot. And the other thing that they like, which we've been doing a couple of times, is um, bathrooms that you can go in and out, that you can shower in one place and then go open the door and go to your deck. So you can come from the deck in, in two directions. Um, this is, yeah. I'm doing this one too. <laughs> we divide it. <laughs> right beside it, um, in the same block, and that we have um, in the same area, there was two houses that were commissioned to do at the end, but in this, and the difference from this one, this is hidden between the palms. There's no palms, there's no, it's much more of an open vegetation, but I have a straight view towards the end of the canyon and it steps down very quickly. So what we have done is create three levels going down. This is a point of entry and it has this big stair taking you down to a garden, a room garden at the bottom, the same mm -hmm. in this case. And it's just sort of a stepping down and create a terrace. Oops create a terrace at the bottom space. And that's the room on the garden. So basically it's a big lounge with the sliding doors taking into a deck and then you go to the canyon. Every single floor has the stepping rooms. And you do the oh. moments. And this is the same canyon. Um, this is a very special house that um, we did for first neighbors, then friends, then clients, and still friends. And they're, <laughs> and they're here today. <laughs> Um, and it's a house that's, unlike being in the palms, it's in the eucalyptus grove. And it burned down, and similar to all these other houses, they could only rebuild in the same footprint um, and the same size house. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to build the same type of, of uh, construction. And so, and they also love birds. And so we created, or we tried to create something which was a tree house where they could enjoy the birds of the canyon. But they used and to live also in a tree house. It was, yeah, it was a tree house in a way before, but it was more enclosed. And we also, they also have a macaw, macaw, macaw? And we designed a large space in the kitchen for Mookie. it, where Mookie, where it could go in and out and be a part of the house. And basically designed the house around the cage, really. <laughs> and so well, we Mookie had became a very important person in the house. Yeah. Actually, the house was designed for Mookie. Yeah. And we had to be very, very efficient with circulation. So the circulation just wraps in a little space, so there's no corridors. And the two bedrooms and two bathrooms are just stacked on each other with split levels, everything facing the canyon. And it and was so small, the house, that we have to utilize as much as possible the outdoor spaces. But there's no outdoor spaces because you're floating in the air. Right, so every so room has an extension. There's a roof deck that comes from the kitchen. There was Nikki. And it really opens up to the canyon um, below. And, that's, uh, and the master bedroom is below. This is the living room. And the living room, again, has all these pocket doors, the pocket doors on all three sides of the living room. The decks kind of cantilever out to the canyon. And the living room, here you can see on the right-hand side, has pocket doors on all three sides. So again, the room disappears and kind of blurs the line of being indoors and outdoors with a canyon. But, it, but in, 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 <laughs> and in this like and in this house, it really feels uh, successful to us the fact that when you open all the doors, you are so close to the trees and you're surrounded by the trees that you really feel like you're in a tree house. Um, another typical site, which was a great experience and it was a learning experience, is uh, Julian. Uh, we were engaged to come up with a design for the dean of the engineer school of uh, the UCSD, the engineer school of arts. And he has a piece of property in the top of the mountains in Julian, which is somewhere here. And the biggest asset of this location is obviously you can see downtown from Julian in a nice day. You're surrounding for huge forests at that time. And um, the lake. That was a beautiful site, and it's still a beautiful site. So what we did is design a house that um, it has a, the living room, uh, it has a triangle shape with the end of the stair, 
So every single time that you go up and down, you have the tunnel of the views, and I explain you why. It, it funnels towards the view. It's three stories, and at the end, at the top of the, of the roof, we want to have a lookout place where there is a huge jacuzzi floating there. And the idea is to have, to have a lookout on the roof that almost looks like an eagle watching the entire mountain. And that's the idea of at night when we turn the lights, that this big room in the middle um, will celebrate the hills and the mountains. And when you go up to the studio and the jacuzzi, he will be, the family will be gathering together in this covered space, but celebrating the views. And that's what we're talking about. It's the triangle built double space, the top of the mountain of Julian, the deck floating, and a very simple materials, but it was much more the shape of the, of the space. Um, unfortunately, the house burned uh, after the fires and um, San Diego stories, but we rebuilt it again. So it's okay. been built Without twice. Wood. Without wood, we covered with metal. metal and, <laughs> and concrete panels, <laughs> very different. <laughs> It's actually a red house now, another red house. Um, this is a house in La Jolla that we um, worked on that's on a canyon in Scripps Estates. It is, we call it the round house because it creates this big curve and encircles a southern, a southern garden. And here the challenge of the project really and, and capturing the, the best of the site was that the street, which is on the on the eastern side is much lower than the canyon's edge. And so uh, the, the challenge was to bring you up to the top of the canyon in a kind of graceful way, and then also to have a sequence going through a garden to the front door. The same thing is that we had the garage off of the street, and we wanted the entrance from the garage to the front door to be ceremonial as well, so that every day when you come in, you don't always have to feel like you're going through the back door. Um, and so here you can see the view of the curved portion that overlooks the, the canyon, as much open as possible. This is a path that leads up and winds through the garden um, that Leslie Ryan designed. This is really a beautiful succulent wild grass garden. Um, and this is the, the path, the, the interior path behind these walls is where you get from the garage up to the lobby, to the entrance, just views. Is this the house that's modeled back in the other room? No, that the model of that is a visitor center in Los Angeles, which we'll actually show you at the, at the end. It's also curved. <laughs> there are a few curved houses. Um, and here you can see the roof kind of going towards the, the most, the, the best part of the view and a really beautiful pine tree at the end of the site. These are just views from inside of the house. A lot of the materials, again, we carried inside and outside. The wood paneling comes up the walkway and comes into the interior circulation path, so you can continuously feel like it comes with you. The stone floors go indoors and outdoors, as do the concrete floors. And this is the passageway from the garage up to the, to the entrance, where we used, instead of having a room for storage, we created a wall of storage with windows in between, and then the other rooms on the other side. And these are just pictures of Super always materials. everything, everywhere uh, the idea was indoor and outdoors, even the bathroom, you have a little patio um, to go outside. Uh, in another example of site conditions in San Diego, in Sings to Learn, um, we were uh, engaged to do a house in Rancho Santa Fe, and we were concerned about, oh, we've been doing small houses, how are we going to deal with a big house? Um, but the beauty, when we went to see it, um, the typical Rancho Santa Fe is the rolling hills, you know, these beautiful rolling hills, and the views are different, it's much more like a valley, and it has its own beauty. The only problem that we had there is most of the houses get a little bit of a hill, and then they flatten it up and build a house. And our intuition right away was not to do that, it's actually the opposite, it's just sort of keep the hill and even kind of promote more the hill and instigate more of the hill sense, so kind of uh, endorse more that situation. So in this house, which is... Um, Can we change it? No, I'm just going to use it here. So that's the side when the house was built, but when we started the studies, we basically decided to s continue the hill at the top of as, as high as possible and create an L-shape for the private, for the bedrooms and the private courtyard. This is a master bedroom with a studio, and the living rooms go from the bottom to the top to the main living room. This is a study that we did when we started the project, and this is how it was finished. 
and you really feel the mountain and you feel the hill all the time. Um, there's also a place where uh, there's a lot of restrictions and they were trying to force us to do a certain style. We wanted to, they forced us to do pitch roofs, but we convinced them that the pitch roof could go in the other direction <laughs> so we can be able to get, to get the light inside the rooms and get the views. So when you're from the inside or the outside, so I went too fast. Um, from the in, this is the entry. And there's a lot of indoor outdoors. It's, um, and now we knew how to do well packet doors and all those things, so we did even bigger <laughs> ones. <laughs> After we experiment with the Lomax. <laughs> so um, this is, for example, the type of feeling that everywhere that you're in the house, you always climb into a, a, an important place. And the living room, the main living room, it's on the top, which is celebrating with the fireplace. So you go from there all the way down to the music room, which is somewhere here family room, dining rooms, kitchens, music rooms, and all the way up. And you get that sense all the time, um, like this one too. And the materials were simple. It's just basically white stucco, stone floors, and wood, the three elements all around it. And once the doors are open everywhere, it's the same finish as indoor, outdoor. Um, so I guess the dream on this one, the concept on this one was how do we keep the hill and how do we make the hill even stronger? Uh, we haven't heard complaints about the too many steps yet, but eventually we will. Um, and this is a house we just recently completed in, um, in Malibu um, on, a, on a very, very tight site. It is 33 feet wide and 300 feet long, <laughs> right here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how they divide and those lots. We, of course, wanted to maximize the ocean views in this little area here. So <laughs> <laughs> the challenge. Um, the, the house originally had a tennis court and that was shared with the neighbors, which we removed, and decided we should make a very long, linear garden. Um, and again, the challenge was to really maximize the views of the garden, the ocean, the distant views of the mountains to the east, it's actually to the really south in this case, um, and to, to maintain privacy from your neighbors, which are three feet away, literally three <laughs> feet away. <laughs> so here's the, so the, what we decided to do was to create a long atrium, the whole length of the main house. Like most of the houses there, there's an entrance house with a garage and a gym and a guest room, and then the main house is towards the ocean. And so we created this atrium, which we felt would allow light into the center of the house, because that's a very big challenge, is with buildings on either side of you. And then it would also emphasize, every time you walked in the house, to, um, that you would look towards the ocean or look towards the garden. And so these were some of the, uh, the early sketches, actually, that we did of the project. And then the other di idea is also that you walked through the garden. Part of the garden was the entrance, that you walked right to the front door, but then there's also places that are really important for this house that to be off of the ocean and away from the winds where you could really live outdoors because the wind is so strong on the other side. And again, we, like, we use very simple materials here. I wouldn't say simple, they're extravagant in some way, but not many materials. We used um, stone and, and wood inside and outside. The stone floors go inside and outside. We chose the stone floors because they were the color of the sand. They were a limestone. Um, you walk over um, a, a water feature as you walk in. And then this is the atrium, which takes you the three stories up. The, the, the house is three stories. And you can see as you walk in, you look right towards the ocean. And then as you walk back, you look towards the garden. And so there's this constant dialogue back and forth in the atrium. Except that in this one, you, we introduce something different. It's, it's a screen inside. We always use some pipings to create screen on the outsides, but this one we use it on the inside. So the glass is out, and this wood screen is inside and creates a special shadows and bring the light in a different way. And so it changes during the day, and you really feel the, the sun moving. And the other thing that I was interesting about the atrium is there being awareness of, sorry, the the beach in this side, but if you look here, the Malibu Mountains. So every single time that you go up and down or go for to, from your car to your bedroom or to the house or to the beach, you are aware of the mountains and you're aware of the ocean, extremely clear. It's like a little street more than anything.
And then that's the living room, the atrium at night. It looks like the house is very close to the level of the ocean. It's it very is. close. It's I mean, it really is. Tsunami land. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and actually, yeah, they were. It quite nervous just, about that. And it's actually, um, the, the owner of the house has a studio on the third floor, which is here, and he's looking in two directions. It's like a boat, really. He commands the boat. He's a captain from there, looking from one place to another one. And that's the view from the, from the bedroom. You really do feel like you're in a boat. There's, you can't see your neighbors at all. And this is looking back into the living room, dining room, kitchen. We did. We put a planter with grasses on the top, so you go back to the you go back to this line. So right. when you're in bed, you just see the grasses and then the ocean. And you don't see the people. So on you the never beach. see anything. You <laughs> see the people at the beach. Yeah. Or the people wants to see you. Yeah. <laughs> That's more. That's mostly. <laughs> you know, everybody who walks around Malibu, they want to see who's yeah. in their houses. Exactly. And. So this really led us, this is one of our first institutional projects that we ever worked on, which is the Robert Payne Conference Center. And having worked on all these pretty spectacular sites for houses, we were given a really spectacular site to work on here. Um, intimidating. I think our biggest fear was that we could ruin it. Nine years after. <laughs> yeah, it took nine years. Nine years. <laughs> um, it was hard to get it, hard to make it, hard to build it, hard to <laughs> everything. Um, but. And I think we really, I think the word that we kept in our minds the most was one of restraint to keep it small, keep the scale right, not to create a wall for the rest of the campus. But um, the other thing was interesting. Um, it was this is the first institutional building from the UCSD, which is touching the urban area of the of the community. It's basically the introduction to the urban fabric in La Jolla. So we felt like uh, it's a perfect transition to design a building that is not institutional, but it has to also feel residential. Right, have the two scales together. And we broke up the program into several structures and we connected it with trellises. Um, we, uh, there's an auditorium and four meeting rooms of different sizes and Surfside, which is a, a student lounge. And um, we tuck this into the hill so that its, it's size from the east is not too large. Um, and here you can see the section of the auditorium that opens up to the lobby, to the garden, and then to the ocean. And we designed the, the auditorium as a box within a box so that it can work as a formal auditorium or it can open up and become a part, open up to all the different layers and they slowly peel away so that it can be a multi-purpose functions and be part of the ocean view. And so this is a view looking from the ocean side into the auditorium. On the roof of the auditorium is a restaurant that's soon to be opened. By who? Um, by Giuseppe. Giuseppe. Yeah. Giuseppe is taking over the restaurant. So the restaurant's not in the picture, it's right over here. <laughs> and that's a terrace where people can eat from, from there. And then here is showing the four, four meeting rooms and there's the auditorium. And people, the thing that's very nice about it is that people just walk through the building with their dogs and their surfboards and it really just feels like it's part of the but beach. But this is the science to Which this, is so you know, nice. That's, that's all scripts. I mean, this I think scripts. that's what's really nice about scripts. Um, this is looking at the eastern patio, um, which is kind of a pre-function space, which is protected from the winds. And that's really important about designing near the ocean, is you always need spaces that are protected from, from the elements, as much as you want to be near the elements and see the ocean. So this is the patio. The walkways protected with the trellises, vertically and horizontally. It's a lobby. This is, the, this is the lobby looking out, and the, again, pocket doors. <laughs> we can use pocket doors in institutional projects as well, when they allow us to. And then we actually use pocket doors in the auditorium. Here, you have an informal lecture, then the doors pocket into these panels, and then you have basically two layers that open up to the ocean. Yeah, and that's the move that sort of guides the concept of the project, the entire concept. It's just to sort of create a room that celebrates the sunset again. You know, that for us was very important. How do we engage that? Just different ways that it can be used. So um, we also were challenged, we, we are interested on public work. And um, one of the biggest challenges that we got is um, we got a job to do a police station. And talking about patterns of design, the police stations have been designed the same way for the last 100 years. They're all concrete block, 
boxes, no windows, no nothing. And um, the, the, the police department hired us to do one of the uh, police stations. And of course, we, it, was, it was great. They were fighting us and we fight them, but at the end we convinced them to do what we think after we learned and we apply things on this project. They have a very triangle building and the street, what is the name of the street? I forgot. Camino Real. Camino, El, El Real. Camino Real. We felt that we couldn't control ourselves to not create a building that is much more linear and in front of the street and it has a huge curve that brings people. One of the things that we discovered was not very good on the police stations is that the employees, the administration, everybody gets in different places and they never see to each other. They never communicate. So I guess sometimes they do the wrong things because they never talk to each other. So we decided that we have to straight that up and create a place where everybody comes in from one place or another one, but they see each other through so this big street. And that street is where they go to their offices, go to the, to the uh, meeting rooms, to the bathrooms, to the gyms, to the, anything that it has to do with their activities will be in this street. And therefore, this street sort of shape was shaped by this big curve that was kind of engaging the space. And then there was a simple diagram. At the same time, there were two buildings one was a police station, the other was a community center, and we felt that they need to speak the same language. So when we start, this is basically what we end up doing. It doesn't look like a typical police station. Uh, Jerry Sanders came to install the building. He likes it, so he approves it. Um, he, as a police member, was very happy to see something different. What it was, uh, basically, was a huge atrium. That's the street. These are the conference and office rooms. It has a, a very curving concrete wall that gives the protection sense, but we bring light and natural light. Yeah, the requirement was eight foot high concrete walls around the whole building, basically, except for in the entrance lobby. So that was quite a requirement. And that's the street. Basically, this is a, a, the entry street, and these are the rooms to the conference and, and gymnasiums, and uh, everything, every activity that has to happen comes from here. There's always natural light coming from the atrium, and also there's glass above. So the inside rooms, like this one, for example, which is the office, get light from the atrium, natural light coming from one side, and also natural light coming from the other side. So it's very sustainable. It has a lot of energy savings just with the natural move and the location and the orientation without having to depend on so many complicated uh, equipments. Um, and this one. So this is um, also in La Jolla. This is Eleanor Roosevelt College, which we did in collaboration with Moshe Safdie and Associates. Um, and this was a really large, this is a completely different scale. Um, it's a, a whole campus. And we wanted to create a village. We really wanted to have a heart. And the concept is to really design the building, to have, have the outdoor spaces be the main spaces, and the buildings being secondary and framing the outdoor spaces. And so it's split between Scholars Drive. This is North Torrey Pines. Um, and the ocean is um, below, facing west. Here's the ocean. And so we wanted everything to orient towards the ocean as well. And so we have, we created um, the housing that steps, it. first of all, it's a campus that has housing and dining and, and student centers and library and um, the Great Hall. So it was really a, a, whole, a whole college campus. So you can see the scale of the project. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is to try to create a village and to create places where, children, where, where students would gather. We did it on the, on the west side with the green and they were anchored, we made the spaces anchored with the dining facility and the main public spaces of the campus. The dining facility, and then we had the Great Hall on the eastern side of the campus, um, which anchors the long promenade on that side. So here you can see the great, this is the green, the, and, and uh, now the trees have grown in, this was just as the, it was completed. Here is the housing and the dining facility on the top at night. So this is on the eastern side and we have the resident residences bridging over this long promenade and the Great Hall which has views of the ocean as well. And that's it. And um, one thing that has happened working uh, in California and has been our practice developed is that as uh, the passion that we have for resolving the sites and kind of responding to the natural conditions 
has um, kind of introduced us to work with parks. And um, we were very lucky, uh, seven years ago, we got involved um, working with state parks to create a visitor center in, in Los Angeles. And uh, the state parks just got 57 acres of land in Culver City, in a very important area surrounding the entire LA basin. And um, they bought state parks this land for $40 million. It was an enormous amount of investment for them, but they want to create a public park and want to create a space, an open space. Um, so we got the job, and our job was to work with the landscape, work with the land, and create a building that has some program for visitors, and basically an exhibit room, a small theater, and a lookout place. That's right, um, and they bought, they bought the land for $48 million, and they had $7 million to develop the property. So, right, and that was it. Never got bigger than that. It so was that, yeah. this was this was a big thing for us because suddenly we became landers and landscape architects and planners and everything. It was a big experience on doing that, but we thought it was exciting. And um, there were a couple of things that were very important. We felt that the building has to be a unique building to the site. It has to almost kind of disappear if it's possible and then just sort of create abuse to what the, the most important areas, which is the basin of LA. Um, the other part is that in such a small, tiny little budget, uh, how do we make it attractions to the park? And we came up with this suggestion that we might, we will suggest to them that we would like to have the <coughs> lookout place in the right location that leaks at 360 degrees of LA but create a big, big street, it's a pedestrian walk all the way, steps going all the way 400 feet from the street to the top of the hill. And we did that because we felt that, you know, every single city in the world has a mountain that you can climb on, a place that you sort of feel like it will be a place to go, a place to sort of celebrate something. And the LA doesn't have that, it's all about the car. So how can we create this kind of place? And um, we, the stakes park, they didn't want to do it, they didn't want to do it, there's no budget, there's no budget, but at the end we convinced them that it's not a stair, it's a climbing structure. And we did it, <laughs> we did it with what they call our concrete marble, recycled, recycled, which is recycled yeah. concrete. So basically the contractor got all the concrete that is used in construction leftovers, piled them up and created this stair. And now it's the most attractive, I guess it's very successful because everybody goes there to do exercise up and down and they call one to shatter and it works very well. So, and so just to give you an idea, this is Jefferson, this is the entry. We basically became traffic engineers because we have to resolve all these different issues, go all the way up to the top, minimum parking and a hidden spot, a little pedestrian entry and then you start walking through the buildings. And as you're walking through the buildings, you start engaging into a landscape forms and suddenly you arrive to the lookout place, which engaged an enormous amount of views. And I'll take you through. That's the building. Uh, it's full of very simple landscape. It's kind of a building that is sitting like nesting, like a bird that is nesting. It's two materials, concrete glass, two, three, concrete glass and stucco, and glass basically. Um, this is the area where it's always engaging to see in the views. And from the outside, from the other side, the land goes all the way to the touch. This is basically the roof, and the building is much much lower. So it's almost as you walk into the park, you see the edges of the roof, and it follows the forms, like this one. So you're at the top of the hill right now, in some of the hills, and you're almost at the top of the roof. And this is the pavilion, and we felt that it was important for the Angelinos to create some sort of kind of an angelical form to a butterfly form that sort of frames the views of the city. This is Santa Monica, and the other side is LA. And it's a place where it captured the sunset again. It's kind of a celebration itself because it reflects everywhere. The sun is all over, and it's very quiet, and the, the wind is very strong. And when you're up there, it's extremely quiet, and the most important thing is the wind and the sun. It's just very powerful. And in this room, we use it for lectures. Here we are making a lecture at that time, but they're using it all the time. It's just simply a pavilion at night and last to noon. And that's the reflection of the sunset on the glass. And that's the stairs. That's the stairs. 
Yes, sir. We have these YouTube videos of people going up this thing. <laughs> we felt that it has to be something like a bring the Aztecs into, bring some of the cultures into LA. <laughs> so why not? That's it. And That's when the you go all the way to the top, this is where you arrive. You arrive to this huge lookout place, and this is what you see from there. And as you climb into the top of the hill, you suddenly discover the city of LA, downtown LA. And we shape all these hills in order. This is all handmade at the top. Uh, just to sort of frame the views as you're moving from one place to another one. So this has been a great, ex a great uh, exercise for us. And we'll just and show you very quickly just the several bridges that we've done. Um, and we'll do it's part of the landscape work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very and, yeah, and, and just like houses and just like institutional work, sites are really the clue to the designs and most of what we do. And this is a Scripps Crossing, which is right on La Jolla Shores, very close to um, the Robert Payne Center. And it so. was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone probably goes under it every day. But we did this with Frieder Seidler. That's how we got involved in bridges. He really got us involved with bridges. And it is, it's a cable stay bridge, which is anchored on the hillside. Um, and then it's uh, suspended towards the ocean, so it feels delicate and leaning towards the ocean. And it also has a false um, a, a perspective, a false perspective with the bridge narrowing towards the ocean so that it feels like it gets more delicate towards the side, towards the ocean. Mm -hmm. And we work with Frieder on the lighting and having the light um, you know, kind of disappear um, behind the guardrails and the proportions. And that was really our first bridge and a very exciting, very, very well, exciting. So that yeah. we've just have been doing a lot of bridges. Right. And then but we find yeah. it fascinating because they're all about siting and environment and context and people and cultures and, and, and community. Most, it's not about just a personal work, it's just suddenly, this is Lake Hodges and um, it's a simple sketch, it's basically a very, it's a, it's, a, it's a ribbon structural system that basically hangs from one side to another one. It's floating again on the lake when we have water. So it was designed and conceptually thinking when the lake has not water, when the lake has, when the river has, the right. bridge has water, I'm sorry, when the lake has water, when the lake does not have water, the bridge is slightly different. Um, and it fits very nicely in the, in, in the context. And we did this with T.Y. Lynn, so we work with structural engineers when we do these um, bridges. Sorry, and from all of these ones, we also get engaged, one day we got engaged a uh, phone call to work on a, old train bridge in the city of Des Moines that the city wants to restore it completely. So we went there, we restored it completely. It was a collection of bridges and we insert a new pedestrian walkway, basically all new inside. And where the tracks are for the trains, we create a wood walk. And we add a lookout place for the community to go and fish. They were shocked by the red. They didn't expect they would become with the red color. But I think that when you see it like this, in that context, it was, it was perfectly fine. Now they like it. And they love it. Now they're perfectly fine with it. And then one recent work that we have, is, um, which is on the boards right now, we were, we're working on a handmade island in Qatar, Doha, where we're doing a, a life bridge, meaning a bridge that has practical use inside on it. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a difference there's many different islands that are connected and what the, what the client was interested in is to create a bridge that they have some activities on it so people engage coming up and they can sit on these areas of glass and have coffees and teas or smoke cigars and go back and forth. In Qatar, people go at night quite a lot because it's hot during the day. During the night, it's very nice, so they spend a lot of area time there. So um, we're developing this project as we're speaking right now. And this is one of the recent uh, images that we have. So is that a pedestrian bridge? it's yeah, a pedestrian there's bridge. There's two of them, two, two yeah. kind of. It's a pedestrian bridges. bridge, and these are the glass areas, and it's covered with canvas. And this is where we have some. We're going to have some furniture, and there's a coffee kiosk, and they will bring foods and things. So it becomes kind of a lively bridge. And locally in San Diego, project. we just have Harbor <laughs> Drive Pedestrian Bridge, which is in downtown San Diego, which this is our renderings, what we start three years ago. And, and this is also with T.Y. Lynn. And this is, this is, the opening is going to be April 5th, a couple days from now, which is a special suspension bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge. 
So through these bridges, we have been able to work with a lot of different groups uh, to create much more of a pedestrian life experience across from one place to another one, engage in buildings, engage in urban grids, engage in different functions, and trying to make the public spaces as beautiful as the private spaces, which because we think we deserve that somehow. And that's it. Thank you. Have any questions? Very, very involved in the Robert Payne Conference Center as well. Extremely involved. Very, very involved in our life. Yes. <laughs> very, she very was very, so. very involved so, in Shaping. So many, many, many. She was very, very involved. At every single meeting I think we ever had about the project, she was there. Yeah. She was basically part of the design review process. Actually, we considered her the client, even though she was not really officially part of the service. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any comments on, on your observations of the difference of working with, with uh, private clients versus institutions versus, say, like the Department of Transportation or the engineers who are doing a new bridge project? Is there any difference in the design experience? Um, I think I think they're very very different, but I think I, I think you can I think you can have the same kind of variation in a private client as you can in an institutional client. If you can have a great institutional client when you have a very strong person leading the design, and the same goes when you have a private client who really is, is um, can lead the design, not lead the design, but has a lot of inspiration for you. So I think that both can work well and not well, you know, in that, in that sense. Yeah. You know, but that similar. Sounds. I mean, they become a private client in a way, or you know. Characters, yeah, people. There's always a strong person in public world, somebody else who's leading. You hope that there yeah. is. And if you find that person, if there is that person, it's, it's just smoothly, it's much easier. So, how do you convince the police department to have class? <laughs> that was very hard. That was very hard. Um, but you know, it comes down to cost a lot in those situations where you have to convince them that it's not much more expensive or not more expensive given, given the budget. If we can do it within the budget, then they're open to doing it. Um, and we'd have to do models and renderings and get them excited. And again, you know, actually with the police station, I remember there was one person involved at that moment um, who didn't stay involved very long, who was very excited about the idea. Had that person maybe not been involved at that moment in the building, it might not have happened. Yeah, know? but there was another factor too, that it was a moment where sustainability and green issues were coming yeah. along very strongly. So they were open-minded because they thought that, okay, we've been doing buildings with air-conditioned boxes, black boxes for all these years, and something's not working, and now we're going to a new period. So they kind of felt that they need to go to a different type of building. And then that was when we kind of pushed that, that the shape, the orientation, bringing natural light was a key. The, the way that the roof is located towards the sun so we can get some photovoltaic attached panels. They couldn't argue with that. They suddenly felt that they kind of, there was no room for them saying, we want the same stations that we have for the last 20 years because something has broken down in the system. There's new ideas coming up and that helped. Mm -hmm. That, that helped a lot. lot. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a philosophy? Uh, we always feel that we do art in our work as itself. <laughs> we, but no, but we do really have artists that work with us, and in most of the bridges, we have some artists working with us from the beginning. Yeah, I think we like it when it's much more integrated. I mean, if there's an opportunity to integrate it versus have it happen after the fact. So no pop art. Right. I mean, it's not that no that can happen as well, but if we have the opportunity to do something that's integrated. Better. I mean, yeah. much better. I mean, we didn't hear, but Lake Hodgett's bridge, not Lake, um, the Torrey Pines bridge that we did, where we worked with Jim Scalman, 
He was where, very cold. Yeah, it's the underside of the bridge is really where the bridge is visible or is important. And he worked with getting the textures of the concrete and the color of the concrete and picking up of the sand. And so that idea where you're really collaborating and there's no line between sometimes the art and the architecture is can be great. So Raquel. Yes. Yep. Well, what's your guys' favorite project that you've done? Ooh, that's a good Ooh. question. That's Raquel. a hard question. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. <laughs> Which was our favorite project that we've ever worked on? It's the mm. one you're about to do. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> well, I was going to say something. I mean, well, John and Joel are here, so I'm not just saying it because they're here, but I think it was a very, when I said it was a special project, um, it was a special project. I think that every, a lot of things came together. In that, in that yeah, the tree time. house, I will say, we are very attached to that house. Yeah. We did different things and we respond to a very special conditions. And also we have a very strong relationship with the client yeah. and we still do. And, it, and actually that house is beside our house, so we see it every day. <laughs> <laughs> so it became, you know, it's part of our, you know, we actually mentioned to John many times that he doesn't own that house, that we own that house. <laughs> That's part of our contract. The tree house, you said that. Right. Increase the number of stories. You couldn't. We couldn't increase that. We basically had to keep in the same footprint and the same square footage. I think what we did, the way the we manipulated it, the same volume, same, pretty much the same volume as well. The only thing we there did high we manipulated the roof. The before the old house had a lot of roofs, and so when we when it burned down, we said those roofs had all, all been really terraces, and so we created terraces from what had been roofs. You know, we kind of played around, but we couldn't increase it. How did you two learn to collaborate and share a vision on, on the science? In the dining table. <laughs> <laughs> and in the Could kitchen. Ask our daughter. <laughs> and in the kitchen cooking or preparing dinner or doing things like that. Well, we worked together because we went to school together. Um, that's the beginning of it. So it always has been, you know, we've kind of been practicing since we went to school together. And then even when we practice, we've always been doing things. So became sort of a, st a way of living. And also we have different emphasis somehow and it's very complementary. So we trust each other judgments and criticisms as we're moving along. So it's like uh, making a meal together in a family. You know, we all sort of get together and discuss the menu and you know, work together to make it happen. And if somebody else burns something, it's the other person's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Your innovative use of bridges brings to mind some of the abandoned railroad bridges across the river at Poughkeepsie, across mm -hmm. the Rondout Creek outside of High Falls, New York, and, and with the idea of the, the new High Line Park in New York, is there mm -hmm. some way to take those bridges which are just left to rust because right. nobody could afford to tear them down. Right? Yeah. There is very expensive nice. to restore a bridge like this because that's the problem. I mean, it would be nice to collect them and at least if we're not going to use them, just put them in some place that we can connect them and maybe create a collection of bridges that <laughs> becomes historical and you can walk them through. The problem is, in some of them, you can decide, you can basically bring them apart and re 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 uh, rebuild them in some other areas. It's the the rust which is a problem, and that takes an enormous amount of, of funding to restore and to paint the special paintings. The red bridge that we show you, there was almost two million dollars just on painting the bridge, which is very hard. It was done by a bank in Des Moines, which is, has a lot of money, who felt that that was her gift to the city. Because the rivers, the bridges in the Moines were basically the cross point of the country, the, in the middle of the country, who goes east and west. And that particular bridge was bringing enormous amount of commercial activities to the west. And that bridge was pinpointed a very important historical element. So they had to do something for it. But there's many bridges all over there for the park. We're working with, uh, uh, we're working right now in Portland, which is a, is a bridge town. There's beautiful bridges all over. The whole city is involved with bridges. Bridges are much more important than buildings in that city. And they were doing a new bridge with the city of Portland. And the old bridges are also falling apart. And they don't have funding, so I have to restore them. So it's, it's, um, 
it's a sad moment on those bridges, but we definitely think that we should find a way how to restore them and keep them or reinvent them somehow. Uh, it was a delay because the, the, the stainless steel elements were done in some factory in Chicago and they haven't delayed on manufacturing the pieces and weld the pieces correctly and we also, um, they, send us, uh, they send us some pieces back to install but they were not well done so we didn't accept them so we returned them back so they can do it again. <laughs> So it was that sort of thing, that quality, we were demanding for certain quality, and that took some time. Yeah, it's, there's always some timing on, on those elements, and, and this one was that, uh, a particular issue was the timing of the, of the stainless. There is, everything is a stainless steel, uh, as you can see, and the stainless steel is important because it's basically part of the structural system. Okay. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.